Hey everybody, uh, it's about 11.05, so I'm going to go ahead and get started talking. Um, so welcome to extracting data from Drupal entities without dying inside. Um, I don't like dying inside, so I've made some tools that I'm going to talk about, and they might help you too, so share the love, right? I'm Patrick Coffey, I work at Four Kitchens, you might have guessed by this shirt that I'm wearing and by the color of my slides, but uh, I'm an engineer, and so I write lots of code and do things with Drupal and Node and anything that I can get my hands on. So Drupal is really awesome, right? It's a really good tool for uh, managing and organizing your data and, uh, and expressing content types and, and, and data structures, and uh, we have entities and content types and blocks and all sorts of great tools that help us just basically define data that we want to store and then store that data, right? It's pretty easy to use. And then Drupal also has some really amazing tools for rendering that data, right? We can use view modes and field formatters. We can use views and panels to create these complicated layouts and these great little uh, systems for rendering web pages, right? And pretty easily we can make a site that's really well structured and, you know, and, and it's easy to work with. <clears throat> so that's really not a problem, right? Using Drupal to store and render data is pretty much easy as pie. I mean, there are some complications here and there. It, you have to have a lot of talent to work with Drupal. Everybody in this room is probably like, awesome. But, but it's, for all intents and purposes, very easy to make really nice websites. So that's not really the problem here. We're not going to talk about that. Um, everybody here is, you know, into Drupal. You're at a Drupal conference, you know, and you probably use Drupal. And so I don't need to sell you on that, right? <clears throat> so the problem is when you need to get data outside of Drupal, it can be a little bit challenging. Because Drupal entity data is kind of complicated, Drupal is kind of a troll, right? You try to get that data into Google Spreadsheets or into a Mongo collection or into Redis or into some other system, um, almost any other system, and you're going to have a hard time transforming those entities into something that's consumable by that system in a sensible way. <clears throat> and so the problem is when you actually do need to get that data out of Drupal and, and put it into something that isn't related to rendering a web page or renders a web page differently or is something just way different than Drupal itself, it gets really complex and actually turning those entities into something that's consumable is really hard to do. There are lots of Drupalisms in the entity API, right? I mean, if you just look at the object that represents an entity, you're going to see a lot of stuff that's extremely specific to Drupal, the Drupal as a system, right? And that's not bad. That's completely OK. We need that data. We need that information to render stuff within Drupal and to work with it. But getting those Drupalisms out of those entities is really hard. It's, and it's hard for external systems to eat that Drupal data, right? So extracting data from and structuring Drupal data so that it's consumable by other systems can be really, really challenging. I mean, even within Drupal, if you're writing some code, right, and you get an entity object and you want to take those fields and modify them and work with them and have some custom template, right, even that can be a little bit challenging, right? You have to go through a, you know, an hour process and like step through and get that data and put it here and put it there. And then formatting the Drupalisms out of the fields is actually kind of hard too. Because not only is the structure of the entity a little bit Drupal-y, right? Uh, the fields themselves and the data they contain are very specific to Drupal. So these problems are, are kind of hard to solve. Uh, and the really tricky part is creating extraction rules and formatting patterns that are uh, reusable, extendable, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and rules and formatting patterns that work really, really consistently. Typically, when we want to do this, right? Let's say that you have a Google spreadsheet and you want to get data from your Drupal site into that Google spreadsheet and you're writing a little bit of custom code to do that, right? Uh, you would generally approach this uh, from just the perspective of creating a set of functions that would um, use the entity API, maybe the entity metadata wrapper, to take the entity object, get field data out of it, and then put it into the other system, right? That's just, I mean, it's a pretty simple process. Um, and 
this can become really problematic really quickly if you're doing something that's not just really basic, right? Let's say you have three sheets that you want to put data into and you have two different entity types and you need to format the fields on that entity and the way that the entity is structured in three different ways to fit those three different sheets that have three different structures, right? Now we're in a complicated mess. Now we have these functions that, you know, there's 10 of them, now there's 20 of them, now there's 30 of them, right? The code base just gets way out of control. You have a function for turning a field into something that can be put into Google spreadsheets. Now you have another version of this field that's completely different, but it needs to be formatted the same way. Now you have another entity type, another content type that has the same types of field, but a different instance of the field, uh, and it's supposed to be formatted slightly differently, right? It just the the uh, the scenario can get really really complicated really fast, and it's hard to keep up with just a bunch of functions that process entities. So I have an example situation like this. It's actually not an example situation. It actually happened. Um, I needed to get data from the entity API so that it can be consumed in a very non-Drupal way. I just needed objects that had data that I could render, right? <coughs> there were very specific formatting rules uh, for the data that I was going to be sending to somebody else that they were going to consume, right? Um, coming out of the entity API, we had a very a very specific structure that had to be followed, and then each field within uh, the pieces of data I was I was shipping out uh, needed to be formatted and um, needed to have the right context, uh, and that context was extremely um, specifically defined. So there were some very interesting and complicated rules. <clears throat> I needed to process a lot of different entity types and a lot of different fields on those entities of different types, um, and. Initially, I used view modes to process and organize the data, the data formatting and extraction patterns, right? So I said, okay, well, I'm just gonna have a view mode that I apply to a content type, and I'm gonna have these fields in this view mode, right? And then I'm going to put a field formatter on it, and it's gonna turn this field into this thing, right, that's processable, right? And this worked for a little bit uh, until I started really building everything out. Uh, and the field formatters became really, really hard to manage across all these different uh, view modes. And there were so many different entity types and so many different view modes and different uh, edge cases and different uh, situations that, uh, in which the data need to, needed to be formatted differently that it was just really clunky to hold that in view modes and field formatters. <coughs> Uh, so I switched to functions, right? Uh, I took entity uh, objects and processed them with, with these functions that would grab the entity object, get a field, get the data from that field, process the value, make sure that it was, you know, uh, make sure tokens were replaced and that sort of thing, uh, and, then, and then returned it, right? And this was also really difficult to manage because just like I had a lot of uh, view modes and field formatters, I had a lot of functions. And, parent functions and sub-functions that need to be called uh, to construct an object of, of data that fit the format that was expected. <clears throat> Both solutions inevitably resulted in really big and bloated code bases, right? I had to define a ton of field formatters to get the results I needed when I was using view modes, right? And I didn't even get really that far down that path because it just got so complicated so quickly. Um, and, and then when I was writing functions out for all of this, uh, I had a lot of functions to find, and then I found that there were rules that different fields shared, but there were uh, fields of different types, so I had to combine functions, and then there were multiple people working on this, and we would create the same function with a different name in two different places that did the exact same thing, or some iteration of it, and so like collaboration was just impossible. Um, it, the code became really, really undry, really confusing, and really hard to maintain if I handed this code base to any of you and asked you to continue developing on it, you would have been really angry at me, would have gotten my address, come to my house, and you know, done something really bad to me. Because, and, and I would have deserved it, right? So it was terrible. <clears throat> this was super frustrating. I was really mad, I was really sad, I just, I just went to bed. Uh, I quit, I shut my laptop, I don't even know if I did that, I probably just left it up and running, and I went to bed with my cat, and I cuddled. Uh, and I died inside, right? All the hard work 
I was put into organizing all this stuff, right? I was like, yes, we're gonna use view mode, it's gonna be so rad. I'm gonna organize these fields, buy these field formatters, it's gonna be so cool. All the organization, all the functions, all that just completely failed as the rules grew, the data, you know, ba the database grew, all, er everything was like getting more and more complicated. The methods that I were implementing just completely failed me, so I went to bed. But then I got up, and I decided to create a mechanism that would solve these problems for me and for everybody that was having uh, these issues and having to go to bed with their cat uh, and, and just go to sleep because they were so depressed. Um, so I created this thing that I called a still, right? Because, uh, you know, you take water, you drink it, it tastes gross, right? Uh, you put it in a distiller, and it tastes good all of a sudden, right? You're taking all the good stuff out of the water and leaving all the bad stuff somewhere else, right? Um, that's the concept. I, I don't know. I, I drink a water of all sorts, to be honest, but I don't know. I was, I was laying in bed with my cat. What'd you expect? <laughs> so distill, what is it? It's a name, uh, but the thing that it represents is a Drupal module that enables dependent modules to extract and format data from Drupal entities in a hyper-structured way. I say hyper because that's like kind of a cool word. Um, distill contains two classes. The first class uh, is a processor class that defines field formatters. Uh, right? These formatters um, choose which fields they're formatting by the type of the field or the name of the field. So you have a processor class, right? And it says, okay, here's a method. And this method processes fields that are of type text long. And all fields of type text long should be processed in this manner. And then it can also contain methods that uh, have that process explicit functions. So let's say you have a field text long that's called field body, right? That's pretty common. Um, let's say you want to process it differently. It's an, it's an edge case, right? So you can create a method that processes that explicit function. You can call the other method from that function and get the results and like and share the functionality from that method, uh, and then modify it from there if you want. But you can do whatever you want. But you can process fields by those two characteristics. Um, and then the second class that is available within distill <clears throat> is the distillation class. It's like the distiller, right? Um, and it takes an entity, it takes a processor class, and a list of fields that you want to get out of that entity. And then it executes the processor's formatting functions on the fields that are within the entity you passed in, and out comes this beautiful array of gorgeous distilled data water. <clears throat> to visualize this concept, I created this uh, really gross diagram in Google presentation slide thingies. Um, it's ugly, but it, it demonstrates the concept pretty well. We have entities, we have processors. We have a distiller, we throw those things into the distiller and we get consumable data out. And then we go and we have a party. Uh, and, and the key concept here is that we broke two things out. Uh, we, we organized two things really separately. So, so we said, okay, there are things that get data out of Drupal entities, and that's really kind of all the, always the same, right? It changes on a field-by-field -field basis, um, <clears throat> you know, here and there a little bit, uh, depending on if it's a field or a property or, or de depending on the type of the field. But generally, it all works the same, so we can abstract that into something that is really consistent. And then we break out the other concept into, <clears throat> excuse me, processors, right? And processors are all different. Those are the things that are a little bit complicated. Uh, and we, uh, we just want to break that out, separate it from our extraction rules, and just define how we should get data out of those individual fields, right? That way, we're splitting everything up into these little modular methods that process field data. Right? And that's all they do. You can stick any field of any type into that processor and you will get the consistent result. Right? Because we're always passing in the same type of field or the same field uh, into that processor. This works really well. Uh, it's very organized, it's extremely reusable, and it's very extendable. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I don't know if somebody drank this water, but I'm gonna drink some of it because I need it. I hope it's distilled. <laughs> okay, so distill works in a really interesting and standard PHP way, right? It uses object orientation um, to uh, define these mechanisms that do these different things. 
So processors are classes, right? And those classes contain methods. You can subclass a class, right? So let's say you have a processor class that represents your sites, processing methods, all of them, all in one class, a big giant thing. But let's say you have an edge case. Let's say that you have one entity that is a little bit different, just like you always do on every single site, ever. Don't go to bed yet. We have these processors. You can extend the class. You can just change one method uh, by the name or the type. You can override it. And you can pass that processor in for this explicit entity. And you inherit all the other stuff that's really great. And you override the specific things you want. Problem solved. Everybody's happy. And this is kind of like a, a, another terrible diagram that represents uh, this concept, right? So you have a parent processing rule set, right? This is how you do uh, processing for these fields. All these fields, all these types, images, they need to return a full path. They need to return an entity ID. Uh, that's an FID, right? They need to return a size or an image style. And then you have child processing rule sets, right? And they change the way the images are processed, right? We don't want thumbnails. We want 404 by 400 pixel images and pa full paths that any system can get that image from, right? Uh, so child processing rule sets. And think of this as just like uh, infinitely iteratable, right? You can have as many child processing rule sets and as many child, 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 child processing rule sets, right? You can, you can just do this all day long and create tons of files, tons of processing rule sets. And that can get a little bit crazy, right? That can make you really sad, uh, make you want to die inside if you just like get out of control with this. But that's true for anything when you're working with computer programs, right? Computer science is insane. You can, yeah. So just don't go crazy with it, right? But this provides you a lot of tools that help you organize your rules. And it will work for a lot of use cases, I think. Um, and it's something that is very clean, very clear, very easy to read, and easy to implement. And so now that I've made these claims, I'm going to show you how it works. And we're going to look at some Drupal 8 route controller thing that returns some super nice data that's been really, really distilled uh, using distill. And uh, we're going to look at Drupal 8 stuff, because Drupal 8 is really rad. And I love Drupal 8 a lot. And it makes me love Drupal a lot. Uh, but this module was written for Drupal 7. and it, it has a Drupal 7 version too, so it's important in Drupal 8. There are two versions. If you have a site that's using Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, A+. Plus. Um, this is just kind of standard PHP, right? It's classes, and so it kind of fits into any system. You could probably take this and put it in some like Drupal 9 version that hasn't even been created yet, and it'll probably work. So exiting out of my presentation, we're going to take a look at the distill module itself. This is on GitHub, right? Uh, but it's also on D.O. I recently got my committers access after three years of uh, review. So, man, I'm so happy. Um, so it's finally up there, both versions. If you want to get the 8x version, it's here. Or there's a 7x version, uh, or a 7x 1.0 version, evidently. Um, so it has some documentation. This is basically the entire presentation I'm doing in a README. Um, so it also tells you what I'm doing next on Distill. That's cool. Nobody really cares about that. Let's look at how it actually works. So I've written this module called Distill Example. And this also has a Drupal 7 and a Drupal 8 version. So if we take a look at these branches, yet again, we have a 7x 1.x version and an 8x version. Um, installation instructions, it's really easy. You know how to install a Drupal module, right? We're all Drupal developers. So first off, let's take a look at outputs, right? Here's what it would look like if you took a really simple entity in Drupal and formatted it as JSON and returned it, right? It would look like this. This is really complicated. Look, look, hold on, check this out. So I have an author field. Uh, then I have this und thing, right? I'm, I'm a developer, right? And I work with uh, some super rad like JavaScript life. I've worked with Meteor JS all day long. That's all I do. I don't know what Drupal is, and I see this thing coming from my Drupal buddy, right? He's sending me some data, and I'm trying to like work with it in Meteor, right? So I see this un thing, and I'm like, what is that? What does that stand for? Underwear? Uh, and I, I ping him on Slack. I'm like, man, what is this? 
you can't put this into MongoDB. And he's like, dog, chill. Coming up with a solution. Um, but like, yeah, that makes no sense, right? Uh, and then we have target ID. That kind of makes sense, but it's completely useless to a system that is, you know, to, that's consuming this, this, this object of data. There is an element Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Is that like, ooh, there we go. That's like really big. Oh, man. <laughs> super, super nice. Uh, OK, so that, that's good. But the, the number one means nothing to me as a Meteor developer, right? But the number one, I have like a million number ones in my Mongo like thing, <laughs> right? It has no meaning to me. So that's a problem, right? Tags, same way. I've got underwear, and then I have target IDs that don't mean anything. And then I have like RUF mapping, right? I don't, I don't even know what that is. I could throw that into Mongo, but now I'm going to have to process this entity and like take all that stuff out. Then I have a created uh, date way down here, uh, or somewhere. It's somewhere in here. Last comment timestamp. I don't even have comments. Uh, it's just attached to all entities, but you know, MongoDB. You know, I'm not putting that in there. And then picture zero. What does that mean? Data B colon zero. I, I, I don't even know. Do I have to write all of these Drupalisms into into Meteor? That's so much work, right? I have to create another like reverse engineered entity API to consume this data. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In Drupal, this is great. Outside of Drupal, this is not great. <clears throat> so let's take a look at something that might be like a little bit more rad. I, I totally forgot I had these tabs open and like super nicely formatted, but whatever. So now this is distilled, right? Now check this data object out. We have an ID. That makes sense, that's the ID that represents this object. Uh, we have a title. That's pretty simple, right? I mean, title, we all know what that is. Uh, we have an image, and it doesn't just have like a bunch of weird things. It actually links to uh, an image that I could open in my browser. Uh, then we have a user object that represents the author. It has a name and an email address. It's not just underwear target ID, right? Uh, it has topics, and now they have names and TIDs, right? Now we actually know what ID it is, uh, so we know how to fetch it, but we also know what it's called. And that's really useful when we're considering it in another system. So this is a lot more consumable. Can we all agree this is a lot more consumable by like MongoDB? Yeah? Awesome. Rock on. So let's learn how to make this. Uh, and by the way, if you just like, if you grab this uh, distill example module, throw it into a vanilla Drupal instance, and like visit the paths, you know this will work as long as you have one node and that node's ID is one. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. So th this is this is literally just the output of uh, uh, of this module, and I would show you a live demo, I might pull up a Drupal eight instance, but. I've been told that that's a terrible idea because sometimes the internet doesn't work and everything fails. So I'm just showing you the output that I uh, used curl to, to get. So let's take a look here, right? So we have some routes for Drupal 8. We have a bad route and we have a good route, right? Um, the bad route is giving us bad data and the good route is giving us good data. Don't judge me on this code because I'm actually like not amazing at writing D8 code yet, but uh, it does work. And then if we go into source and we go into controller, we have our route controller, right? So this is cool. I'm going to take a look at this. Let's blow this up for a minute. So we have, uh, you know, our inclusion stuff, our namespace. We use different things. Uh, Auto-loading is great. Um, and then uh, we have this, uh, this class that we're using, that instance controller base. And then we have two functions. We have a bad example method. And we have a good example method. The first example just grabs the first entity, loads it, and returns it as a JSON response. That's what we looked at. That's the crazy stuff with all the crazy things that we don't know how to consume. The good example is what uses distill. Right? So this is really simple. Uh, and we're going to take a look at it. Um, the first uh, line just grabs an entity from, Dan, from Drupal. Right? Uh, and the, sec uh, the 36th line here, this, the second portion, uh, grabs a new instance of the processor, which we loaded above, right? The third thing um, just creates a new instance of the distiller. It passes in the type of entity, the entity itself, and the processor class. If you don't uh, pass in a processor class, it will use a default, and you'll just get sensible defaults uh, that are just really kind of great. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to tell the distiller what we want. We say, okay, I want to get the NID field. 
It's a property, it's a field, I don't care what it is, I want it. And I want it to be assigned to the underscore ID property. Remember when we were looking at that data object, underscore ID is what it was uh, ID'd by? That's how we do it. And then we want the title field property thing, we don't care. If you're using title underscore field, the module or whatever, it's different. So we don't care, we just ask for the title. And that's okay, we can, we can assign it to the title property so we don't pass anything else into that function. <coughs> then we want to get the body and we want it to be assigned to the post uh, property and we want to get field image and assign that to the image property. Next, we want to get the author. But see, here's the thing, the author is another entity, right? It's a user and that's me, hi. Uh, and I have a name and I have an email address. Uh, so I can't just say, give me the author. Right? That wouldn't really work because it's like, give you what out of the author? The author is a whole different thing. Um, and honestly, if you just say, give me the author, it'll give you the whole thing. Uh, but we want to say, give me the name and the email address. So the third parameter of the set field function is what I call the settings function. And that just allows you to pass context into the formatting methods so that you can determine how you want to process different things. Uh, given different situations that are completely outside of the scope of the entity API, right? So, excuse me, now we have an includes field property of that context settings array. And we just pass in the field to want to include from that sub entity. And that's the default behavior of uh, the processing method that processes entity references of any sort. Same with tags, right? It's a, uh, it's a term reference. Uh, we don't care, we just pass in the include field. It doesn't matter, we get back the data we want. And then um, we call distiller get field values and that returns all the things we asked for in the processed formatted way that we wanted. And then we just return a new JSON response to uh, Drupal 8 and it does its thing, it's gorgeous, and now we have JSON, right? And like I showed you earlier, this is the output. Everybody tracking with me? Does this make sense to everybody so far? Looking good? You don't want to like go to bed with your cat yet and like just like sleep? Excellent. So now I'm going to show you a processor, right? So we're calling set field. We're asking for fields. What happens when I do that, right? How does it actually process that? And what if I want to change the behavior of the defaults, right? Uh, this is just a sensible defaults. This is what it will give you right out of the box. But let's say that I don't want that. I want something completely different. So let's back up here. And we're going to take a look at da, 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 this processor. So there's a default processor class within a distill that you can just use, right? And that's the thing that contains sensible defaults. But now we want to change the way that something is processed. Um, so we say, okay, we want to process fields of type process of text with summary, right? So we create a function. Uh, on that class called process field type camel case and then type, right? We can specify, uh, you know, what we're doing, what we're doing the thing on, and uh, and how we're identifying the thing that we're doing something on, right? Um, and then we just get the field value, we use the entity metadata wrapper, right? And then we just return a value. That's pretty easy. But let's say for body field, we don't want to do any of that. We just want to return a string, right? So we say, okay, process the body field, just the body field, and return this string for that field. Don't, tra don't even translate it. I mean, just return it. We don't care. Um, if I were to apply this method to the class that I was showing you earlier, right in here, if I was to say, da -da -da -da. controller, if I was to go in here and load this processor, see this is commented out, the processor, this processor that I just showed you, if I were to look at body field with this rendered example, I would see hi, I am a body field, untranslated. Um, and that, it's that simple, right? So let's take a look at Distill's uh, sensible default uh, processor, right? So we're going to go in here and we see that we have a distill processor.php, uh, or actually So here's something that's really interesting. Um, when you have uh, a, a, a field of a specific type, uh, you can create any field of any specific type. You can create your own types, right? So let's say you have a field of a type 
that this still doesn't work with, right? It supports address fields, right? Date fields, all the all the stuff that makes sense, all the stuff in Drupal 8 core, uh, and all the the equivalents for those things in Drupal 7, right? But let's say that you have something else. How would you add support for that? Here's the cool thing. So the way that this still works is it says, okay, when you set a field, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to check for, um, I'm going to check for uh, the field as the field name in that class, right? So process field name, name, right? Uh, and if that exists, we're going to process that field with that name because that's the most specific thing we could do. If that doesn't exist, we're going to process it with a type processor in that in that uh, in the processor that you've provided, right? So, text with summary, right? We use that processing method. Now, let's say that doesn't exist because you're creating your own field type, right? Which is type pizza. Um, field type pizza doesn't have any uh, it doesn't have any sensible defaults in distill. So, what do you do? Well, the third and final thing that it, that distill looks for is a hook implementation for distill. So you, in your module that you use to define this field type that you're defining, field type pizza, you can uh, use a hook to just define uh, a default processor for that. Um, just because uh, you know you don't want to have to write all those processing methods and then uh, port them around, especially if you're publishing a field type on v.o or you have like this internal module for all of your properties and you use that and ha that has a field type, you don't want to have to like rewrite that method into all of your processors or even into all of your you know base processors. So the hook exists just as a thing that allows you to define those field type defaults from anywhere in the distill system or in the in the Drupal system, I'm sorry. And these uh, these methods here are the default hooks for the fields that exist within Drupal 8. So um, these are really well documented. You can look at this and kind of get the idea of as to what, what's going on. So um, just like the processing methods on a processing class, right, we have the same um, parameters. We have a field, an index, and a settings array that's just the context for it, right? And we can just process the fields as we normally would in a method, just in a hook. Um, and the distill module contains, like I said, all the defaults that you need. Um, an interesting one is, I will find it, is this one, entity reference. So it has several several behaviors, right? By default, it returns um, the, just the ID or the full entity, or it can return the URL if you say, hey, give me the path to this, or it can return uh, a set of fields like I was showing you in the example earlier. <coughs> So this is sort of how this still works, um, and and uh, and I hope that it can become useful useful to some people. Um, does anybody have questions? I this is a pretty short presentation, so I left a lot of uh, a lot of time for questions at the end. Anybody have thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. um, on the on the JSON example that you showed, how easy would it be to to add an additional filter? at the very end of its process, and let's say you had an integer and you wanted to trim it, or something of that effect. Sure, so you could actually do that in the processing method. Let's say that you had a very specific field that you wanted to do that on, or a yeah. property. Um, you could just make a method in your processor for that explicit property and say, okay, do your, do your trimming logic in that, and just tell the distiller to use that processor. And of course, if you want to, you can just get the values and process them after that as much as you want. It just returns an object of data that's well processed. So if you don't want to use any of the processor stuff, you just want to use the defaults and you want to handle it from there on out, um, just as you would in a standard setting, you're free to do that as well. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like one of the biggest advantages over using views ports uh, is that you can now target a type of field rather than every individual field separately. That's uh, correct. And then my second question would be, isn't there a point um, that you know this might be too much overhead? Like if you just want a few pieces of data and you can, you're fine with the CSV, mm -hmm. you know, maybe this is too much. Yeah, so uh, to answer that question, um, two, two things. View modes, uh, they're really hard to manage when you have a lot of them. 
right? You have all these different fields that you need to include in this specific order, and then you need to apply these processing rules, and those have to work, uh, you know, generically uh, for different field types, and uh, you can process things by type or by field in the system with just one function. It's a lot simpler to manage, and if you have a bunch of different content types with a bunch of different fields, a bunch of different formatting uh, processors uh, in view modes, it's just going to get out of control. In fact, maintaining consistency is a miracle in that like instance. It's just there are going to be a lot of mistakes, just naturally. It doesn't say anything bad about the person doing that stuff. Uh, and the second, um, the second item, uh, absolutely. So this system is very, very useful if you need to process lots of data and you need to do that in a very structured way and you need to have a lot of processing rules and formatters. It works really well out of the box. So if you just want to include it and get some data, it works really well for that because sensible defaults are a great thing, right? But this is, becomes really, really, really useful and really valuable when you have a lot of different entities, a lot of different types, a lot of different fields, a lot of different types in different places. Um, if you just want to get three fields off an entity, Use the entity metadata wrapper, use views, use view modes. That's, Drupal has really good tools around that. That's not a problem at all. <clears throat> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, how does uh, Distill compare with uh, some of the tools that you've been seeing in the migrate world? Is, is migrate mostly importing or D2D &D migrations, and this is mostly export or purely export? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, migrate. You could use this structure to do sort of the same thing in Migrate. In fact, I'm sure that they have a very similar structure just based off of what I've seen in the rest of the module. Um, this logic is in a lot of different mo Drupal modules in a lot of different ways. So it's in RESTful. It's in services. It's in uh, search API. It's in uh, the Migrate module. And it's all different in all of those things, and it has really, um, they all work really well, but they're all really different and uh, none of them do solve all of the problems that they need to solve really well for all the other systems because they're specifically created for those different situations. So to answer your question, the migrate module could totally use something like this, just kind of like an inverse of it uh, if they wanted to. Uh, just like the RESTful module could use this to serve data and process it if it wanted to, um, that would be really easy for them to do. <coughs> mm -hmm. What do you do with field collections? Field collections are entity references, essentially. Uh, and the processor that I showed you that deals with entity references also deals with field collections. So uh, when you process a field collection, you say, OK, include the following fields, give those to me, um, and you're good to go. Uh, in the default um, hook implementation for the entity references uh, field processor, it also takes a processor path. So you can specify a different set of processing rules for that explicit sub-entity. Um, you can also get a path to the field collection, an ID for the field collection, and all that's just baked into the defaults. Um, but again, if you wanted to change the way that that works, feel free, go for it. It's really easy. Any other questions? <coughs> cool. Well, thank you very much.